many-faced poem. It comes up as thunderhead, ready to break, roiling dark, and comes up as sunflower or cornstalk, budding kernels of life, or comes up earthy and sweet as soil turned by backhoe, or perhaps as dog, nosing its way hard between us at the hushed crack and flash of storm, clearing its throat for the first fearsome word. On November 11, 2016, my dream press published my first collection of poetry. The following year, the New York Times named me one of six contemporary American poets in a special feature titled, America Today in Vision and <coughs> Verse. Clearly, I had made it, right? The thing is, I never wanted to be a poet. I wanted to be a novelist. As soon as I learned to read, I devoured everything. Books, comics, food ingredient lists, restaurant menus, even the bottoms of tissue boxes. I love stories so much that I wanted to recreate that joy for other people. I started writing my own stories, little half-page scribbles influenced by books like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, and a ton of video games. My scribbles turned into exercises of the fantastic and the supernatural, and I admit I've also written my fair share of Nintendo fan fiction. In high school, I decided I wanted to write the next great American fantasy novel. I even had a 10-year plan. Graduate from my dream university, attend the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop for my MFA, publish my best-selling novel by 25, get a tenure-track job teaching creative writing at some liberal arts college in the Northeast, and live with a big fluffy dog named Bowser. I failed at all of those things. In fact, I failed at nearly everything I've worked for. Failure has many faces, but I've learned to embrace these three rules as an important part of my creative process. One, in order to fail, you must first have a vision. The vision I had for my life didn't quite pan out. To give you a bit of background, I was born in South Korea and adopted as a baby to a family in rural upstate New York. I was also homeschooled, so when I got to college, I wanted to study everything. Between massive credit overloads and my part-time job, I didn't have time to write my great American fantasy novel. Instead, I just dashed off short poems just to have something to share with my writing groups every week. Senior year in college, I met with my thesis advisor to talk about grad schools. Let me preface this by saying that this professor is still one of my dearest mentors, and I admire him for his unflinching honesty. Two important things happened in that meeting. First, my professor said, my fiction was terrible, and I wouldn't get into any MFA <coughs> programs with the writing samples I had. I was crushed. But he was right, and we both knew it. I hadn't put any real time or energy into my fiction. I hadn't been practicing to be good enough to write that best-selling novel. I had totally failed myself. The second thing that happened was that my professor followed up his soul-crushing statement by saying that if I wanted to stay on track with my MFA applications, I might have a shot with poetry. In the end, I decided to salvage my 10-year plan and follow his advice. This decision was not easy for me, but I realized that the reason my failure hurt so much was because I cared deeply about my dreams, which is a good thing. Having a vision worth working toward and then actually failing at it meant that at least I was working towards something great. If you don't set goals, you can't fail, but you can't succeed either. It's a difficult balance between what you can do and what you want to do, which leads me to my second point. Sometimes you fail things, and sometimes things fail you. After nine rejections, I was thankfully accepted to an MFA program for poetry. Although I had only dabbled in it before, I was fully committed to this whole poetry thing. I studied hard, and I wrote like crazy, and I was actually having fun. Who knew that a failed fiction writer could enjoy writing poetry so much? About two months into my final year, my advisor and I sat down to talk about my thesis. 
Let me preface this by saying that this professor, too, is still one of my dearest mentors, and he is admirably direct. Sound familiar? He said, Marcy, if you want to graduate in the spring, you're not writing poems fast enough. But I was doing all the right things. I just wasn't writing good poems fast enough. My creativity was failing me, and I was failing poetry. I had to redirect my energy. I went back to the drawing board. What was I passionate about? Rewind to my failed fiction roots. OK, what do I love about stories? World building, heroic characters, unusual and obscure facts. But how to translate all of that into what I was doing now? Remember, too, that I'm adopted. I grew up without very, with very little access to my Asian culture, so I've spent years researching Korean history as a way to reconnect with my motherland. Why not combine all of that with poetry somehow? I had come across this article in the New York Times about these older Korean women on Jeju Island who could hold their breath for three minutes at a time while they free-dived to harvest pearls and other sea creatures. Unfortunately, it's a dying art because not many young women are going into the business. So these 60 and 70 year old pearl divers might be the last of their profession. As an adoptee, I thought, what if I were de descended from these fierce, amazing women? What if I were to write an ode to their way of life? So I started doing more research, and suddenly ideas began pouring out. I couldn't stop writing and over the next several months. And before I knew it, I was defending a complete thesis manuscript on time. The thing is that technically, I knew how to write poems. And I was writing poems. But I knew I could do so much better. That failure forced me to redirect my focus, dig a little deeper, and try something new to jumpstart my creative process. You can't control everything that happens or doesn't happen, but you can control how you react. Sometimes the best thing to do when you're failing or when things are failing you is redirect your attention to a new and perhaps unexpected source of inspiration. My last point is that failure is a choice. What is the difference between failing at something and still working toward it? Your attitude. In his book, The Good News About What's Bad For You and The Bad News About What's Good For You, author Jeff Wilzer says that we need failure. It serves as feedback. He says, failure is the backbone of the scientific method. We cook up a hypothesis, we test it, and if our experiment fails, we challenge that hypothesis and make it better. Why then are we so afraid to acknowledge that failure is also a necessary part of the creative process? When I felt that my manuscript was as good as I could get it, I started sending it out for publication. It can take up to a year to hear back from publishers and book contests, and in those first 12 months, I received 26 flat-out rejections. I took it really hard. I began to question everything I knew about poetry again. Was I a bad poet? Should I just burn this manuscript and start over? I ripped apart my work, trying to re-envision it completely, and the next year, I sent it out to 14 new places. This time, two separate publishers wanted it, and my first poetry collection came out a year later with one of my favorite presses of all time. In order for my thesis manuscript to become a real book in the world, I had to accept every failure as a learning opportunity rather than the end of a dream. It said that Thomas Edison tested nearly 10,000 prototypes of the light bulb before he built one that worked. He's famously quoted as saying, I have not failed 10,000 times. I have not failed once. I have succeeded in proving that 10,000 ways will not work. When I have eliminated the ways that will work, I will find the way that works. Sometimes failure is just one step of the learning process on the path to success. So I'll remember, you cannot fail without first having a vision, but you can't succeed either. There are many types of failure. Some you can control, some you can't. If you are willing to work to achieve a dream, you will fail, sometimes a lot. But what you choose to do with that failure is up to you. Sometimes you need to redirect your creative focus to something entirely new. 
And sometimes you need to learn from your mistakes and keep at it. So I encourage you to take risks for your dreams, to fail spectacularly, but fail. Because failure means you have a true vision that you really care about, and you're willing to put 100% behind it. I still haven't written a word of that great American fantasy novel. I never attended my dream universities, and my first book came out well after my 25th year. Today, I'm a program coordinator for one of the largest book fairs in the country, but I'm not teaching, and I don't have a big fluffy dog named Bowser. I have two short-haired dogs named after famous poets. But I'm really happy about how my old dreams have turned into brand new ones. I'd like to close with the first poem I wrote after my manuscript had been rejected that first round, when I thought maybe I should quit poetry, move back to upstate New York. This poem reminds me to embrace failure, to welcome it as part of my creative process, because you never know what might happen. It's called Buenos Dias, Miami. Everything here is from somewhere else. The coffee, the milk, the woman bending over her lunch, even the fresh cut gold of mango running between her fingers, even the ocean gathering itself and its children from the streets paved with palm fronds and heat. The turtles are not from here. The manatees, the alligators, even the heat is from somewhere else. Puerto Rico, Haiti, Ohio. Dwayne Wade is from somewhere else. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, Celia Cruz, Romero Brito. Pitbull was from here with his 305 anthem, and then he wasn't. Carl Hyacin wasn't. Sylvester Stallone wasn't. I wasn't. And suddenly, I was. Now, it seems I am part of this nation of heat that drives down into the lungs of this magic city every day. Storm sky in the rear view. I love Cafe Bustelo Cortadito, sweet with sugar cane, steady in the cup holder of a car I drove down from New York. Here, every morning, I shake my head to the man selling limes or guavas or roses beneath the red traffic light. Every afternoon, I walk to a little cafe window for empanadas, one carne, one jamón y queso, practicing the rollout of R's in a language meant for somewhere else. Every night, I drive back out of the throat of this city, where even the walls say adios, as if they know I'm not from here, as if they know I'm already halfway gone. Thank you.